thank you. Uh, thank the three of you uh, for showing up today. I, um, I'm not a dyed in the wool pinball guy. I've always enjoyed pinball, but I didn't come from pinball. I uh, incidentally uh, wear red shoes. I come from advertising photography. I did uh, work for ad agencies. I did live action and still pictures for uh, all kinds of regular ad agency customers. Had a, uh, a studio downtown, still do, um, and worked for unrelated to pinball businesses. Um, we also do a lot of entertainment related images, photography and live action for a lot of live music and entertainment related things. These are all pictures that I've, I've produced for clients. Also worked for professional sports teams. Uh, I did the uh, Bears team picture for 20 years. I did the Bulls team picture. I did advertising stuff. These are all more examples of stuff. I worked for the Blackhawks and the Sox as well, and the Cubs as well. Um, sat on the floor during all the Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman years and did advertising. I didn't shoot news. I didn't shoot sports action. I shot things that were ads for the team. When uh, teams are hot, they know who I am. When the teams are awful, they don't use me. They don't want to tell that story. Also, other teams in other towns, Las Vegas Knights, for example. And then uh, for years, we also did a lot of NASCAR business. Our clients were literally NASCAR and McDonald's and the Marines. And again, advertising stuff. And uh, <clears throat> my studio and my regular photography and film business was going along fine when one day I received a phone call from a friend of mine, Ed Pellegrini, who had taken a job at Empire Distributing. They were the largest distributor of coin-operated entertainment equipment. And he called up and said, hey, a friend of yours that owns a bunch of bars wants to buy video games. And I told him, no, you had to have an operator. I, I wouldn't sell to him. And he goes, well, where do I get an operator? And he says, well, you know Don Marshall, don't you? And he goes, yeah. And he said, well, uh, He's an operator. Well, I didn't know anything about anything, but thankfully I answered the call that day, and Ed said, this coin-operated arcade business is really blowing up. You ought to become an operator, and I've got your first client. Uh, he's going to call you right away. And lo and behold, later that day, I get a phone call from this guy, a friend of mine, Fred, that it, and said, um, I'd like games in my place, and he goes, uh, this is really big business. Would you like to, uh, could I invest in you and be a partner with you? So he showed up with $70,000 in $20 bills in an envelope. And I went back to Empire and started buying games. So fast forward, next thing you know, I had 77 games on the street and started learning about operating. And thanks to uh, Edit. Empire, he started funneling me towards uh, folks that wanted to test in high volume bars. My, my games were all over the street. And we were downtown on Rush Street. We were in some really, really busy places. And uh, like I say, I tested Pac Ms. Pac-Man. I wish I still had serial number 14 Ms. Pac-Man after they made 250,000 of them. Um, along with operating, I started uh, noticing, I don't know how you not notice, that arcade cabinets were just ugly, weird things that were stenciled, silk screened, um, primitive, just kind of primitive. And I realized that um, I'd never be able to produce artwork for a video game in that uh, you have 12 colors on silk screen, and it just didn't make any sense. And I learned more about the, the way pinballs are actually made and learned about that coefficient of expansion problem that back glasses have in pinballs. You take them in, in a temperature change too rapidly, and the ink all flies off the glass and all the weird things that go along with it, the, the resolution limitations and, and all of that. And that's where McDonald's 
steps in, in that I had friends that worked on the McDonald's account at Leo Burnett, and I understood how their menu boards were printed. And McDonald's menu boards at the time were printed on backlit styrene. And I thought to myself, why couldn't pinball guys do that? It's it's faster, cheaper. It has 16.7 million colors available instead of 12. And if you needed a 10,000 of them, you could get them in, in days, not months. So I uh, was already testing pinball machines for uh, Premier at this at this point, and I went to them and said, you know, we could we could we could do something. And they said, well, we're currently going to do a Rambo kind of game, Rambimbo as some people call this one. And uh, I said, well, you know, I can take a couple hundred dollars out of the cost of your device with using uh, litho printing on styrene rather than glass and we can do photographic sides and we can do vinyl wrap on this kind of thing. Lo and behold, um, we convinced Gil Pollock, the president of Premier, that uh, we should do this. And bear in mind, this is in the early 80s. There's no such thing as Photoshop. So when we needed things to blow up, we had to blow things up. And we needed fire, we used fire. We, we, used, we used special effects technology rather than, uh, rather than retouching. And I already had a lot of that kind of experience from my regular studio work. So we took Gil down to Florida with us and shot this thing. It was in the wintertime. And uh, it, was, uh, it was the beginning of something. Uh, they currently were about to do one more game with, uh, on, on silkscreen. And they uh, converted the process to, uh, to our, our, our idea for going on styrene. And at this point, I already started investigating how big could this really be because I started talking to other manufacturers as well about how to get into the styrene printing business instead of uh, silkscreen. And with Rock, they, they had already printed a non-photographic, but Gil was so impressed with the, the look of the photographic one, he came up with a replacement kit for the Rock game that was new sounds and new art. And I'm not sure of this, I'm not a pinball historian, but I believe this might be the first code update for a, a, a pinball game, you know? Because I don't... Yeah, and, and you got new sounds, new music, and new artwork. And the artwork was uh, one another one of my, you know, creations. And uh, by the way, uh, this, this girl in the, this, she's not a girl, she's an illustration. They, they, they said, we want her in the game. Can you make her photographically? So we kind of just did. Um, and whipped this crazy photo together. And this is also back when arcade manufacturers would also uh, create posters too. So we, uh, we, we got to, to do that sort of thing. Now, by the way, I, I did um, all, we still had a play field artist. I wasn't doing play fields at the time, uh, but uh, we, uh, we were given a real free hand to do whatever we wanted photographically because Gil was making so much more money with this. He had a kind of a languishing uh, old Gottlieb legacy company, Premier, and this was a look and feel that gave him some individuality and set him aside from all the competition. And not to mention, it was costing him less to do the artwork, printing-wise, and the games were making more money, in his opinion. Um, the money he saved in going to this styrene printing process allowed us to have a photo budget to go down. To, this was another one in the wintertime. We went down to Miami Beach and, and shot this sort of thing. Um, this particular image was weird in that, um, again, this was way before Photoshop. One of the neon strips on the building uh, was out, just didn't work. Um, and I had to hire, hire a retoucher to, to complete the look of the building. It looked asymmetrically wrong. The one on the right side wasn't working. And uh, back then, we took our film and had it enlarged to a piece of 2020 by 4 uh, film 
he'd bleach out little areas and then paint that back in. So a lot of this is painted in by a, a guy that uh, retouched cars and did advertising, kind of retouching. Another interesting story is uh, the, the real, this is before Joe Kamenkow started bringing licensing to the, to the game business. So we would, this was during the Miami Vice kind of era and Gil didn't want to, didn't even occur to him to, to get Miami Vice. It occurred to him to hire us to just steal the soul of the, of the uh, style. And the folks in Miami Vice production had the good sense to not use a, uh, a real Ferrari. I did not have that good sense. I, uh, I rented a, uh, a real $300,000 Ferrari. And because I was shooting this kind of towards sunset, we used these big Hollywood reflectors that are big, heavy silver reflectors. And I had a, a, my crew that I brought from Chicago as well as a, a local crew. And some of the local guys I didn't really know, but they were photo grip guys. Well, as the sun got lower and lower, the, the giant reflectors had to be raised well, when we first started early in the day, we had them all with guy wires, uh, safety first, you know. As the sun got lower in the sky, the reflectors had to go higher. They had to disconnect the safeties, and the, and the local crew wasn't tightening these things. A gust of wind came over and smashed the front end of this $300,000 Ferrari. Um, a guy named Joe Marchetti from Chicago, who is a uh, Ferrari expert and collector set me up with a local guy that when I called up and said I need a Ferrari like the the one in the Miami Vice TV show the uh, the guy goes oh okay fine I said uh, I said what color do you have and he goes I've got all of them you have all of them he goes well don't get impressed there's only three but they're still three hundred thousand dollar cars and this is in the early 80s so when I smashed his car his minion guy that was um brought the car, said, uh, my employer insists on hearing bad news immediately. So this was back when there was pay phones. So we go to a pay phone and I'm standing out there and I'm having a heart attack. And the guy is going, yeah, yeah, no, 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 yep, yep, yep. And he's in the smashed. Yep, yep, yep. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. I said, he, and then he says, he wants to talk to you. And I go, he wasn't what? He says he wasn't laughing. He wants to know if you were laughing about it. I go, uh, you know, I have diarrhea of the mouth at this point. I'm just flying and saying, I got insurance. I'll, I'll cover it. I've got production insurance. I got rental car insurance. I got then they need it. And he goes, I just want to make sure you didn't think it was funny. I go, no, it wasn't. It's not funny. It's totally not funny. He said, um, forget about it. Just forget about it. I'll handle it. I go, well, I got insurance. I'll set you up. He goes, no, no, no. I'm going to handle it. Don't worry about it. As long as you didn't think it was funny. Well, whatever. So I called Joe Marchetti back later in Chicago and say, the guy you set me up with, um, he was really great. And I smashed his car. Oh, and the guy, the last one last word, he goes, and by the way, it was original paint. I go, I thank you. I called Joe Marchetti and said, uh, you know, tell about it. He goes, yeah. He goes, he goes, yeah. He, he goes, uh, at least you smashed the right guy's car. He didn't. He wasn't going to make you pay or anything. No. He said, by the way, did I tell you what he does for a living? And I go, no. And he goes, good. <laughs> I still don't know what that means. But I guess I smashed the right guy's $300,000 car. Um, to market this, this is also back when uh, we started doing the designs for the brochures as well as this digital printing stuff. Um and this is Jeff Walker, who uh, who got pretty famous with Premier and worked with several other companies uh, as well after that. Um, carrying on with the same uh, same idea, this is um, a Monte Carlo kind of gaming theme. That's that's in the background. That's David Gottlieb in the gray suit. And Gil Pollock on, on the far on the right with the waitress, and in the center is Jim, Jim Roberts, the owner of the Gaslight Club. And we shot this in the in the Gaslight Club um, again before retouching. I wanted that giant chandelier in the picture, so we had to raise everybody up six feet. They're all on six foot platforms, and Jim Roberts was serving Gil and David Gottlieb uh, 
um, Alvin Gottlieb, brother, and not David, and it's his father, uh, pretty heavily to the point where Gottlieb didn't even have his eyes open for the second half of the photo shoot. It was taking me forever to get my lighting right, so they were just drinking, and the frame that I wanted to use, his eyes were closed, and I had to go back to the same retoucher that did the neon to draw eyes on the eyelids of, of Alvin Gottlieb in that picture. Um, at this point, the only styrene printing was happening in uh, in pinball, basically. It wasn't in the, in the video game business yet. Um, more of the same. We, we wanted Top Gun, but we made gold wings. Um, big hand-painted backdrops. That's a, a, a canvas that uh, is probably uh, 16 feet wide and 30 feet tall is a background, cheaper than compositing. Um, more of the same. You know, I don't like uh, photographic back glasses overall. I, I think they're just what I do or did at the time. I like that old look and feel of, uh, of old school pinball machines. I still do. But this was what I do for a living. Uh, before I started even doing this kind of stuff, I was doing uh, cigarette and beer advertising, and I've never smoked and never drank. But I feel the same way about pinball back glass. You know, I like the old ones, but do the new ones. The uh, girl in the white bikini sitting on the game is the same girl from Monte Carlo. And the one on the left in the little shell bikini thing was the same girl from the rock and the, the rock uh, game. I tend to use the same usual suspects for a lot of what I do. Where things really started changing for me is um, is is when I again I was still operating, and I went to some of the video game manufacturers that I was doing tests on, and because I had a kind of respected test report. And the reason it was respected is because back in the 80s, I bought a Radio Shack Model 3 business computer and a daisy wheel printer and gave uh, printouts that looked like they actually came from NASA of uh, statistical analysis of how your game is doing and how it competes to the comp uh, if it cannibalizes the business from other games or how it works. And they started believing everything I said. So I started testing some of my own art against Japanese art on video games. And at the time, I was able to make American-created art that made more money than Japanese video game art. And I also went back to the printer that was doing the McDonald's menu boards that was also doing them for the pinball back glasses and cut a deal where video game companies would have to go through me. I would be a broker of that new technology. And they were the only printer in the country that was capable of doing that kind of big backlit styrene, huge vinyl, uh, Lexan for control panels and that sort of thing. So Konami agreed to do some testing with uh, with me on this thing. And, oh, by the way, this, this game was not only the first styrene, that, that helicopter panel was a, a lenticular application that that uh, allowed flip motion. When you move back and forth, you could see the helicopter uh, exploding and, and burning in the background. We kind of were biting off more than we could chew with this first one. We should have just done styrene and left it at that, but it was a lot of uh, weird technology that I, I never pursued. That lenticular flip screen thing was really complicated and weird. Um, first, uh, first vinyl printed applique on an on an arcade game was uh, was this Devastators game. Um, we had a certain size limitation uh, with with litho printing at the time that uh, allowed us to have to seam these things. We were doing them three panels at a time most of the time. And things really changed when I started when I did TMNT for Konami. Um, again, uh, way before Photoshop, so that was a giant hand painted backdrop. Uh, hand-painted floor. Those were set elements that we built on the right and left side. This first one we did uh, by dropping in the illustrated characters, but later we actually uh, built our own 
costumes for Turtles in Time. And uh, this was getting back into my regular uh, core competency of doing studio photography stuff. Um, did about 60,000 of these. Uh, a couple interesting notes on this. This is when I went to the to Konami, they were interested in getting parts. They didn't care about the license or the art or anything else. Uh, the art was just a side effect of me selling them parts. Because now I was in the business of um, taking someone's license and executing it for them. So they never licensed this art from me. Konami never, they bought parts. They bought 60,000, eventually 60,000 uh, styrenes, control panel overlays for the first time uh, suddenly printing directly on Lexan. And uh, again, I bought the color separations. I, I contracted the printer. I bought the printing, delivered it right to their manufacturer. And uh, this is the first time that was ever done in the video game business. Now everyone, obviously is um is using this but but i had a really good run of about uh eight years or more where i was absolutely exclusively uh the 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 conduit for um video game final production and at the same time this was my studio that th this portion of it was a shooting space and it turned it into a, basically a print shop because not only was were, were we doing um digital printing that that I was jobbing out to uh it was Serograph was the printer in Wisconsin was the the printer that uh, at the time we were using that was the only one in the country that was able to print on styrene because uh styrene didn't have any, it doesn't have any suction to it they it doesn't doesn't take a the ink doesn't take a bite to it and they had tricks that they did that make it work also uh people were having problem with backlits that uh, they couldn't get the density and Serograph was able to do that without double printing and they also had a uh, interstation UV drying uh, process that allowed them to really rapidly print on uh, on exotic plastics, which is why McDonald's did all the research on it and paid for all that research, and I benefited from McDonald's research. Um, at the time, I was kept them really busy because POGs, I don't know if you remember, POGs were really popular, and they were the POG printer, everyone's POG printer. McDonald's menu board printer and the printer to the entire arcade industry at the time. Anyway, my studio back then, I started to have to print my own stuff because uh, I needed to test the artwork before I was in the test business, if you remember. So uh, we would make prototypes and I wanted prototypes to be good enough to, uh, originally we just did paper and we spray glued them on and took them to trade shows and took them to, out in the field and they fell apart and they looked like hell. So we started buying digital printers. At the time, they were just called plotters, and uh, they weren't used for this sort of thing. We kind of tricked them into it. So we went and learned all about uh, you know, color separation, rip systems, and all of that. I bought laminators, printers, production thing, and a bunch of staff that would allow us to make our own prototypes in-house. After we, on, on, This is on the third floor. On the fourth floor, we had a shooting space where we... We would shoot these brochures and ads and all of that and uh, come downstairs and make onesie twosies and stuff, do proofs and prototypes that were absolutely 100% bulletproof durable, probably tougher than the final product. And that we uh, learned how to uh, print on Lexan and Lex, I mean, uh, print on vinyls and then do um, laminates over it to protect them for durability. So our test games were really, really tough. Um, and we had a whole system. My staff grew to 16. It's not, it wasn't my dream to have 16 designers and production people uh, that, that were uniquely for that business, not my photo business, but just for that. Um, and I won't get into it, but I, I did uh, 250 some different game titles of, uh, of art packages for, for cabinets, all of them for Konami for many, many years, all of them for Namco for many years. I did the whole Tekken series, the whole Soul Edge, Soul Calibur, all of the Tekken games. I did the, the original Golden Tee Golf was a photographic side like this. Incidentally, this guy is the same guy as the Hollywood Heat model. Again, I recycle. Yeah, I did all of that. 
uh, when I when I say I did it, I, I guess I'm oversimplifying it. Uh, for each one of these games, I would do the original concept, the original art, the original um, all of that business. I do the brochure, the marketing, they replay ads, they do everything for them. That's why I had 16 designers actually at that time. Um, and the Konami ads, again, I was doing regular retail kind of cigarette and beer quality advertising, kind of mainstream. And those 1980s Konami brochures that are kind of iconic wasn't my, my cup of tea, but we weren't selling to the public. We were selling to distributors. And these are old men. And so I was always putting old man bait on my uh, brochures. Um, one thing led to another. And next thing you know, I was in the cabinet graphic business uh, producing um, on all kinds of exotic plastics, vinyls, polycarbonates, Velvet Lexan, all kinds of weird materials. Started doing stuff for Gary a, a long time ago. Uh, this is not that long ago, but in, in all of his different iterations. In fact, the guy that got me into the game business, uh, Ed Pellegrini, he got into the game business because he was dating a girl named Sue Jiraki, whose father went to uh, work for... Midway and went to uh, Japan and came back with Pac-Man. And Eddie um, changed my life that day and indirectly changed the whole game business thing. Um, introduced me to Gary's. He, I had already known Gary Stern because I had other, I knew Pat Hamlet and other old video game, I mean, pinball guys. And Ed said, I'm going to start a pinball company. And, uh, I said, well, that's that's good, you know. And I said, um, why? He goes, well, I think pinball is going to be kind of come back. It's got this kind of cycle I'm learning about. He goes, and I hired the perfect guy to run it. And I go, who's the perfect guy? And he said, Gary Stern. And at the time, uh, he was getting his money from uh, Data East, who was going to be a Data East partnership. I go, Gary Stern, the, the only guy that's ever bankrupted a pinball company? He goes, everyone got paid. I go, well, yeah, I mean, I like Gary. He's a great guy, but I mean, really? Well, another good decision. Um, and it was about back then that I started doing stuff for Gary. 1980, did this uh, trade magazine cover. Him and Joe Kamenko. Sure. The Daddy East was the client. And and that's still the format, is that if you do a lot of uh, advertising in a trade magazine, they'll give you the option of having a cover during some period. They'll tell you when. And uh, and and Stern paid me. I've, I've done about uh, 50 mag covers for them. Um, here's some of my Stern trade magazine covers. Some of these are pretty cute. Gary... Uh, such a <laughs> he's Gary he he would say sometimes he'd say look I, I've got eight different products I want to put on there and three of them I don't want you I don't want you to let anyone know what they are and he goes figure out a way to tell that story or look I want to you know typical clients they want to advertise five different products in their ad you know it's it's better to keep things kind of simple but Gary's not a simple guy so we came up with some pretty creative stuff for him over the years. So one thing led to another. I mean, took I took uh, money out of uh, the cost of a pinball game and got manufacturers to have a product that they were able to charge more for and got me in, inducted into the Pinball Hall of Fame, thanks to Robert in 2016. And I won other awards for technology and things for the amusement business. And today, you know, I, I'm still doing all this kind of stuff. Like now it's up to like 400 different game titles I've produced for. Some of that number is kind of fluffed up because I consider it a different title when I did a four-player Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game separate from a, a two-player. It's almost like we're semi-starting over, believe it or not. So now I'm a, uh, now that the game business, arcade business is a, 
as a shrinking pond. I'm a big fish in a tiny pond now. But I'm still um, deeply involved with all the manufacturers. Um, today we're doing lots of video, uh, live action video, for all the different manufacturers. This is uh, Eugene Jarvis's company, Raw Thrills. We do a lot for these guys. So currently still doing a lot of this now. I'm no longer uh, supplying the printing because now my contract with these uh, these printers has elapsed and everybody in the business is using the, the idea of printing on vinyl, polycarbonate, styrene. Silk screen is uh, kind of a thing of the past. Um, and now with digital printing, you don't have to have long runs. At the time, my at, when I was uh, flourishing in this, the runs on a, on a game were 20,000, 30,000, 60,000. And that's the commitment right out of the box where, where now uh, you're lucky to, uh, you know, you get a few hundred at a time. So at the time I could really save companies a lot of money because my process was, was allowing uh, you to come up with these with a, a huge, huge cost savings when you're buying that many. Silkscreen isn't really like that. It doesn't have that kind of same kind of curve. So now with modern technology, my litho printing system isn't really applicable because you can't make money going to a press like that with an order of 100. So now with digital printers, uh, for now, a lot of many, most manufacturers are just doing it themselves in house rather than that because you can make one at a time. Some of these old set elements are still around my studio today. Um, this is some old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff that's still kind of, I just like that stuff. And we still have all the hand painted backdrops to all the games, these giant rolled canvases things. So here's a, let's see if this works. This has some sound. Is that coming through the speaker? This was a movie I made for Robert when I got inducted into the Pinball Hall of Fame. The first few visuals are uh, are from this presentation, but then you see some other stuff too. I think I was also the first person to do a black and white back glass.
This is another example. of Gary said, you know, I want to have like six games on the, on the cover. Well, find a way. Any questions, comments? Wish we could go back to the old way. Unfortunately, there was some casualties to this story and that um, no longer silkscreen uh, on glass is, uh, is vogue. Kind of miss it. Other than this building, it's hard to find. It was to get me in the in the pinball art business, and I'm not even kidding. I I originally thought of you know if I could find a way to to do a photographic kind of application, I could make art for these companies because I I my test route was a living testament to how much money games could bring in, and how I using I I did tests for Konami where I I they came they came with these Japanese games in the 80s that were bizarre and they were just like a inexplicable clockwork orange of weird games were called a Steinex and comic bakery and the Japanese thought it was hilarious I was able to uh, bring an American sensibility to to games that actually made more money and, and I represent the first quarter you know if the game is stupid looking it makes zero money even if it's fun but if I could make it look like cigarettes and beer suddenly I'm in the business which is my original reason for thinking about how to get photographic art on arcade cabinets. This is a question only those here in the, in the audience will hear it. But finally, can you tell us after all these years, why the red shoes? Y you know, I've never been attacked by a tiger and I don't want to change anything. <laughs> I started wearing red shoes a long time ago. I, 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 I bought, I went and bought two pairs of shoes. Um, one were kind of cream colored. They were stupid. And, a, and I bought them in red at the same time. And then at one point somebody said, why, uh, Hey, whatever happened to that pair of red shoes I saw you in? And I know something clicked in my small, space and thought watch this and that was maybe 40 years ago and I've never worn a pair of shoes that aren't red yeah yeah I mean it was like that I I now I'm at to a, I have 147 pairs in that picture there there actually were more than that I'd never seen all my shoes together before that picture it was kind of disturbing clearly I have issues um and and you, you all have 147 pairs of shoes if you've never thrown your shoes away, ever, ever. So I just put them in boxes, and I stored them away, and I had them all over them. I had boxes of shoes, boxes, because I knew one day I'd take the picture. And uh, that's where it came from. The pair that you bought me, those Uggs, Robert bought me a... Uh, a pair of red Uggs that I'd never seen before, and I've seen some red shoes. And by the way, I'm if you decide for some reason, uh, if there's something really wrong with you and you decide to start wearing red shoes, uh, they're very easy to shop for. You could go in a, in a shoe store, and when I go, go red shoe shopping, this is exactly the process I take. I'm walking in a mall, and I do this. And I'm done, because if there's not red shoes, I'm just not buying. It's real easy to buy red shoes. And now with Amazon and shoes.com, you could just type in the color red, and they're real easy to find. So, yeah, no, there's no really voodoo kind of thing. There's not, you know, um, it just became an affectation. And Gary Stern says, well, you know, I used to wear suspenders and white glasses, and you wear red shoes. And Yeah, Walter Day with his black and white striped. Just how it is, and now sure. there's a lot of people. Jack Danger like tends to like wear red shoes. There's other game people, video game people that wear, now wear red shoes. I can't. I, I just to me it looks it looks normal on me. I think it looks weird on everyone else. 
Yeah, part of the yeah. brand. So my question, uh, were you operating in 1980? Hmm? So you probably remember Stern's Ali. This is Stern Electronics. They had a game called Ali that uses a f monochrome photo of Muhammad Ali. Oh yeah, I didn't. I didn't screen. operate that at the time. Um, I started in about uh, eighty-two or something. Eighty, eighty-two. When, well, like I say, um, Eddie sent me a game called Ms. Pac-Man, and it was serial number fourteen. So it was February of eighty-two or something like that. I'm really terrible with dates. And um, tested pole position. Tested, you know, all those laser games. I tested all kinds of stuff that worked. Stuff that didn't work. But games were paying for themselves in uh, a month, two months. You know, games cost $2,300. They were making $700 a week. It was crazy. Yeah. So I bring up Ali because that had a photographic image just in a black screen. And, yeah. And it was... And then know, the silk screen over it or color, something. Yeah, you know, some what they thought was his flesh tone filling in. Yeah, that's uh, funny. So, it, you know, it's sort of half a claimant to the idea of the first photographic backlash that we know of. Maybe Gottlieb Fastdraw had a very tiny piece of the black screen that was also, I believe, derived photographically, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. It could have been drawn. It was... Uh, it wasn't the resolution. Oh, you know, yeah, the, it was you know. low res. So uh, it wasn't, I mean, technically it's kind of photo the way lithography is photo. You know, it's technical. Um, but, but, um, but yeah, in, in fact, that, um, that Genesis black, black and white thing that we did, it wasn't really black and white. I shot it in color. And then it occurred to me that uh, why don't we bleach it back to, you know, monochrome. And then I hand colored it with, with photo oils. And ironically, the product is called Marshall's photo oils. It's nothing to do with me, but uh, we used Q-tips and just made a big print and rubbed, rubbed the color on it. And we, we decided we liked that version better than the, than the full color. So I shot it in color, bleached it to no color, and then brought the color back with my Q-tips. And that's, that's interesting also, because it's all, all analog, no, just, Go in the computer and make no. it monochrome or anything like that. No, my my partner at the time, Ken Hale, uh, he still I still work with Ken all the time, said, you know, someday we'll do this stuff. We'll do this stuff on computers. And then he said, well, most of it. And that's where he was wrong, because he was right about someday we'll do it on computers. And now I can't do it without computers. I can't. I can't even. I can't. And uh, and by the way, all this old stuff is film. I shot everything on big film and retouched it on bigger film. And just to get in the door at the retoucher was 400, 500 bucks at least. And that's just to draw the eyes on Alvin Gottlieb. It was a clearly a different world. I have a question about uh, where you found uh, the talent to, or the people they used on the different back glasses. Yeah. Like, like Raven. Like where did that gal come from? She actually worked for Bally, and it was a premier game, a pinball, uh, a Gottlieb game. Um, her, um, she was the girlfriend of a guy that I knew, and she was an aerobics instructor at a Bally's health club, which I thought was funny. And there was a time a little bit before we decided to use her that she didn't think she could because she was going to be on a competing to Bally's product. And Bally was kind of like freaked out over that. But uh, actually finding all of these people was super easy at the time because, like I say, I did regular cigarette and beer type advertising. I knew all the modeling agencies. I was right downtown. I had uh, all the access to all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I just had casting. Although I typically would use the same people a lot over and over again, um, just because they were very good and versatile and easy to work with and knew, understood wardrobe and uh, understood the things. But, but I had actually, I came from all that. For most people, that's real hard to do. For me, it was just what I did for a living. Um, like I say, I knew all the modeling agencies and all. I was in the right place at the right time. 
it was, uh, it, in a way, it, it changed pinball in a giant way in the 80s, but it didn't really change what I did for a living at all because this is just exactly what I just did do for ad agencies all the time. Now I was just doing it for a manufacturer of, of a, a Japanese game or a, a pinball game or whatever it was. So yeah, for me, it was all the same, but it really revolutionized the uh, the arcade art business. It was um, it was kind of a weird culture shock for the first time uh, pinball started printing on styrene in that um, when the, the truck uh, showed up with um, like uh, a thousand back glasses, it was it was just this not pallets, you know, and they weren't concerned about temperature changes and all that sort of thing. You know, that coefficient of expansion thing was a nightmare. I solved that one accidentally. So you, so you, you had your um, uh, printing studio and were operating. Uh, do you still operate? Operate games? Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm no longer an operator. Um, I did for eight years and it was outrageously wonderful, <laughs> but, um, now the payback on a pinball operating a pinball is, uh, four years in an FEC, you know, I was spoiled. I, I tested the uh, pole position. It made a thousand dollars a week. You know, and and back then manufacturers um, helped me with the testing. Like if I tested a Williams game, for example, I could see them in there voting. Big bags of ballots. <laughs> and I thought this is the damnedest thing. I got the game f for free to use. And then the manufacturers come and give me more money in the coin box to just make sure the votes were there. It's a world gone mad. I love this country. Thank you.